In this tutorial, we will highlight United States copyright basics and also present some exemptions to copyright that impacts the use of copyrighted materials in academic settings. The purpose of copyright is set out in the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. The intent of copyright law is to motivate producers to create content. Like most of us, the creators of content need and want to be paid for the work that they do. If they don't get paid, they cannot afford to continue to develop new and diverse materials. Creation of content is something that benefits us all. A couple of notes about the original phrasing as it appears in the Constitution. Copyright is applied for a limited time. It does not last forever. And there are exclusive rights reserved to the owner of the copyright which we will cover in some detail. In the United States, one does not have to do anything formal in order to apply for and be protected by copyright. Copyright provides automatic protection once the creation exists in a fixed and tangible form. The basics of U.S. copyright law provide for the following main points. Copyright automatically applies once a creation exists in a tangible form. It protects the rights of authors of original works of authorship. Copyright covers both published and unpublished work, and the law grants copyright holders exclusive rights, which we will explore further. As stated in Section 106 of the Copyright Act, the copyright owner has the exclusive rights to do and to authorize any of the following. To reproduce the copyrighted works and copies, including photocopies, or in sound recordings to distribute copies, to create derivative work from the original, for example, translating into a different language. To perform the copyrighted work publicly includes literary, musical, dramatic, and choreographic works, pantomimes, and motion pictures and other audiovisual works. To display copyrighted work publicly includes posting something on the internet, such as a blog entry, or uploading an original video clip to YouTube. You may need permission from the copyright holder to do any of these things. Copyright duration. How long does copyright last? For works created on or after January 1, 1978, copyright remains in effect from the moment of creation until 70 years after the author's death. For works for hire, anonymous, and pseudonymous works, copyright remains in effect for 95 years from the date of publication or for 120 years from the date of creation, whichever is shorter. There are a variety of works that are protected by copyright, as you can see on the left. And also, there are a number of categories that are not protected by copyright, as listed on the right. As we have noted, written works of any kind are protected by copyright. As soon as it is written down in any tangible format, including blogs and wiki posts, it is protected by copyright. Images, photos, and graphs in any format are protected, as are sound recordings and software. Movies and videos are protected and can range from professionally produced Hollywood movies or documentaries to short video clips produced on your smartphone. Music is protected, both score and lyrics. Sculpture and architecture, design drawings, architectural blueprints, and the actual structure or sculpture are all protected by copyright. Finally, pantomime and dance are protected, although there is one form of dance that is not protected by copyright, interpretive dance, because it is changeable and not fixed in its form. To the right, we have a list of things that are not protected by copyright. Any works that are not fixed in a tangible form, an idea for a book or story, which has not been written down, is not covered by copyright. Titles, Names and slogans usually are not protected by copyright law, but may be protected by trademark law. Such things as ideas, the laws of physics, and factual data are generally not covered by copyright. For instance, the white pages of a telephone directory are simply a data set of names, addresses, and phone numbers, and are not protected by copyright. But the yellow pages of a telephone directory contain unique advertisements that are protected by copyright because of fixed design elements such as typeface, font size, images, and layout that make up such ads. 
While a simple recipe may not be protected, a cookbook author's design, layout, and unique description of cooking technique is protected by copyright. Works in the public domain are not protected by copyright. Public domain refers to the works that are no longer protected by copyright or that were never protected by copyright. There are three main categories of works in the public domain. One, works produced by the U.S. federal government when used in the United States. Contracted works by the U.S. government may not be in the public domain because the contractor may own the rights. Works that are produced by state governments may not necessarily be in the public domain. That may depend on the situation. Two, works for which the copyright has lapsed because a work was published, A, before 1923, B, between 1923 and 1963, and the copyright holder failed to register or renew the copyright restriction, C, prior to 1989 and failed to include the copyright notice. The third category is works that are gifted to the public domain. An author or creator can choose to share and make works freely available for others to use, putting them into the realm of open access. Some examples of works that are in the public domain include The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, The 9-11 Commission Report, and of course, the U.S. Constitution. While copyright registration is not required for copyright protection, it is indeed required in order to sue for infringement. It also has the benefit of creating a searchable public record for that specific work. The copyright symbol, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with, also is not required for copyright protection. But it is recommended because it serves as a simple visual reminder that lets users know that something is indeed protected by copyright. Copyright registration is not required in order to display the copyright symbol. Some other basic copyright concepts. Digital content includes things such as ebooks, photographs, websites, electronic databases, Digital content is afforded the same protections under copyright as non-digital, traditional, paper-based works. It is also a common assumption that online content is not copyright protected, and therefore it may be freely used and modified without permission. This is simply not true. The fact is that almost all content on the internet or in any other digital or electronic form is protected by copyright and you must obtain permission from the copyright holder in order to reuse it. In light of this, print books and electronic books get the same protection. Analog musical recordings and digital musical recordings get the same protection. A print letter and an email letter get the same protection under U.S. copyright law. Attribution. Attribution is not a substitute for copyright permission. For instance, including attribution on a copy of a work that you are reusing such as putting the author's name on it, will not relieve you from copyright infringement. Attribution is not the same as permission. Public domain is not the same as publicly available. They are, in fact, two very different things. Publicly available refers to anything that can be accessed or that you can find, either via a website or through magazines or books, or a subscription that you may have access to, anything that can be viewed or read publicly. Many people are lulled into thinking that because so much information and content is publicly available, especially via online resources, that it must be okay to use whatever you find. This is simply not true. If you wish to use something that is protected by copyright, you must obtain permission from the holder of the copyright unless certain limitations and exceptions apply. Unfortunately, from time to time, copyright infringement does occur. This happens when there is unauthorized use of copyrighted material in a manner that violates the copyright holder's exclusive rights. If the copyright holder has registered the work with the U.S. Copyright Office prior to the infringement, the copyright holder may sue for compensation. Court-ordered compensation may include damages such as lost profits from the infringing activity, or if the lost profits are smaller or indeterminate, statutory damages could range from $250 to $150,000 for each act of infringement. For each act of infringement, if the court determines that infringement was committed willfully, the statutory damages may rise towards the higher range of $150,000. Courts ordinarily will also enjoin the defendant from future infringing acts. 
The copyright holder must establish ownership of a valid registered copyright, access to the work, and substantial similarity between the works in order to sue for infringement. Limitations and Exceptions What are limitations and exceptions? There are several limitations on the exclusive rights granted to copyright holders under copyright law. These limitations and exceptions attempt to balance the rights of owners slash copyright holders with the needs of the public. We will review each of the following briefly. Section 109, the First Sale Doctrine. Section 107, Fair Use. Section 110, Limitations of Exclusive Rights and Exemptions of Certain Performances and Displays by Instructors or Pupils. And Section 108, Reproduction by Libraries and Archives. Let's start by going over Section 109, the First Sale Doctrine. Physical ownership of a copyrighted work is not the same as owning the copyright to that work. You can physically own a copy of a book or a CD, and there are many things you can do with that legally obtained copy. You can lend it to a friend, you can resell it, you can throw it away, donate it. You can do just about anything you want with it. However, you cannot distribute it, make a derivative work, or publicly perform or display it. For instance, if you have a song on your iPod that you want to give to a friend, you have to give the actual iPod to your friend so that he can listen to it. You would not be able to send it to him electronically, because technically that is making and distributing another copy of that song and transferring it to someone else. Transferring ownership of the item does not transfer the copyright. Section 107, Fair Use. Fair use does not mean that it is fair for you to use any work that you want to. It is not an exception to copyright compliance, but it is a defense for a claim of copyright infringement. Section 107 Fair Use attempts to balance the rights of the copyright holders with the needs of the public. A fair use analysis must be conducted on a case-by-case -case basis and is determined by four factors, which we will go over. When conducting a fair use analysis, these four factors must be considered. Each must be considered equally, and no factor can outweigh the other. First, we have the purpose and character of the use. Is the use giving the infringer a direct financial benefit? Has the use transformed the original work? The business benefit gained is not all about financial gain or profit, no matter the organization type. The gain of business benefits of any kind from the use of someone else's copyright-protected content is less likely to be seen as fair use. Next, we have the nature of the copyrighted work. Is it a factual work, such as an autobiography or a scientific study? Or is it a creative work, a work of fiction? Generally, creative works are granted a higher level of protection, and this factor can weigh heavily when a creative work has been infringed upon. Third, we have the amount and substantiality of the portion used. How much did the infringer use? Is it many pages or passages? Is it the whole book? Whole article? There are no set page counts or percentages for something to qualify as infringement or fair use. Even a small portion may be considered too much if what was taken is considered the heart of the work. Finally, we have the effect of the use on the market or potential market. Did the infringement result in an economic loss to the copyright holder that she would have otherwise been entitled to receive? Or was there no market effect and therefore possibly no damages at all? Consideration of all four factors is necessary to determine whether or not copyright permission is needed with respect to any particular use or pattern of usage. Again, no one factor alone dictates whether a particular use is indeed fair use, and at least in theory, other considerations beyond the four statutory fair use factors may come into play in the course of a fair use analysis. Another point to keep in mind is that you would not know if something is considered fair use until you are actually standing in front of a judge making a ruling on the case in question. There is nothing you can do beforehand to determine whether an instance complies with fair use. Only the judge of a specific court case makes such determinations. This takes us to Section 110, Performance and Display in the Classroom. Copyright law provides educators with a separate set of rights in addition to fair use to display and perform others' works in the classroom. These rights are in Section 110 of the Copyright Act and apply to any work regardless of the medium. 
Exemptions for instructors and pupils include situations involving face-to-face -face teaching, works used as part of teaching activities, use for a nonprofit educational institution, and the use of a lawfully made copy of the work. The TEACH Act applies to accredited nonprofit educational institutions and government bodies and provides specific copyright requirements for online distance education. TEACH includes additional requirements calling for the educational institution to develop copyright policies, publicize those policies, and include a notice of copyright on online content as well as some technological requirements. These technological requirements are to ensure compliance beyond just assigning a password to protect online content. This leads to Section 108, Reproduction by Libraries and Archives. Section 108 provides specific exemptions for libraries and archives in which they may make reproductions without obtaining permission from or providing compensation to the copyright holder. In these instances, reproduction is meant to be isolated and unrelated. It should not result in the related or concerted reproduction of the same materials over a period of time. Neither should reproduction be systematic and serve as a substitute for subscription to or purchase of the original work. For more information about copyright, please access these sources. The content of this TCC tutorial originates from a webinar produced and shared as open access by the Copyright Clearance Center.